You are listening to Social Europe Podcast. We discuss cutting-edge thinking on politics, economy and employment and labour with some of the most thought-provoking people around, including Nobel Prize winners and other internationally acclaimed experts. So welcome and enjoy the conversation. This episode of Social Europe Podcast is brought to you by the New School for Social Research. The New School for Social Research is a world-renowned graduate school in New York City, offering master's and doctoral programs in the social sciences and humanities. New School students and faculty work to understand social problems through progressive interdisciplinary scholarship and create new ideas in the world. To learn more about the New School for Social Research, visit newschool.edu. Okay, Branko Milanovic, thank you very much indeed for taking the time to join me today uh, to have a discussion about the topic of your uh, most recent book. And in order to, to start the, the conversation, uh, in this book you argue that capitalism has uh, basically won the fight of global economic systems. Uh, how exactly do you derive at this conclusion? Um, well, it is a really a pleasure to be back here. It's always a pleasure to speak with you. And uh, now let me go to your question. <coughs> I am really an empirical guy. I mean, I have spent my whole career being an empirical guy. Now, I do, of course, have an interest in political issues, in, in uh, essentially capital, I mean, you know, definitions of capitalism, evolution of capitalism. But I think what is very obvious, if you are looking simply from the empirical side, is that you have currently uh, the expansion of capitalism, which is really at the peak, historical peak, to, uh, m compared to any other period in history. And I'll explain that in a minute. Of course, we don't know how it will be in the future. But currently, <coughs> if you compare the fact that capitalism now is really the only mode of production and the dominant rather mode of production, not only in all the Western countries, where actually even countries like Sweden employ 70% of uh, workforce in profit enterprises run on capitalist principles with wage labor, privately owned uh, means of production. And then it, the same thing it true is in all former communist countries, including obviously Russia and Ukraine. Uh, it is true in India, which actually still has, of course, a large segment of self-employed farmers and others. But the segment of capitalist production has really expanded. And finally, it is also true for China. And this is one of the points of my book. I argue that China is in the way that it actually operates as a capitalist country. So if you take that, and then compared to the situation before the fall of the Berlin Wall, when you had a significant population, including then China and of course parts of India and obviously communist countries, up to one, well, between 25 or 30 percent of the population that were not part of the capitalist system, then today's ex extension is much greater. So it's purely empirical. Now, there is a second part where I think actually capitalist system has expanded recently, or maybe I should put it like uh, commodification has expanded recently, and that was the, the, through digitalization, which has introduced an entirely new uh, sort of market, or many other markets, which did not exist in the past. Not only that people are now making money simply by having us <coughs> as individual users participate there by clicks and advertisements, but even we can use our free time to make money on, a, on platforms. And finally, uh, the new markets are also, which are interesting markets, so I think we should not sort of discount their importance, the ability that we now have to use our ho homes or apartments as capital, because they were a past personal property. You know, in Marx it's very clear, personal property is what is your property, but you don't use that as a capital. Now, we are actually using the apartments as capital. We actually, whenever we are not there, we rent it out, we get money. We are using our cars now as taxis. So, you know, these are totally new markets. And if I look at that too, I notice the expansion of capitalism. So that's where I'm basing my sort of claim empirically that the extent of capitalist production is now much greater than, than ever. And uh, so interestingly, you make the <laughs> argument that the, the advent of digital technology has basically expanded the scope of capitalism because pri uh, previously private 
uh, areas that were called off like your private car. It right. was 95% idle, but now you have an ability to Absolutely. rent it out as a car or you, be, you become a part-time taxi driver right. or your spare room in your house used to be idle. Absolutely. Right? And now you use it not just as your private property, <laughs> but as literally capital to run a sort of sideshow as a hotel business. No, this is actually, I think, quite extraordinary, you know. It is... Uh, uh, attracted quite a lot of attention, but not necessarily from that point of view. But the ability now to commodify uh, our personal property has really been, I think, dramatic uh, revolution. And then also uh, the very fact that certain things have a price. You know, uh, my apartment, I still have not rented it out on Airbnb, but clearly there is a certain point at which, let's suppose the price goes up, or maybe I don't have enough money, the very fact that I know that it is actually capital is going to influence my decision. But in the past, you know, you didn't have a market, it was not a capital. Now, obviously there were small cases, you would actually rent it, you would post an announcement in the newspaper, or you would maybe go out in the street and put it on a tree, you know, okay, I've got an apartment. But <coughs> the marketization or commodification is much more efficient because you would not do that and put a post on the tree, nor would anybody come, because very few people would see that. And you would do that only maybe if your apartment is empty for two weeks or so. But now you can rent your apartment for one day, for one night. So actually the, the advantage of, this, of, the, of the platforms that we have and the ability to connect like that has actually enabled that type of commodification. And interestingly, maybe that might already be the second step. The first step was probably stuff like eBay, where everybody became a trader. That's true. You actually sold your things that yes. you had idle in the, in, the, in the attic or in the cupboard, uh, not, using, not becoming a capitalist, but you okay. became a trader first. Yes. And later on, you know, once you were socialized with that kind of idea in your head, you became a, a private capitalist. Yes, it is actually, I think what, what capitalism is now doing very successfully with our full kind of participation is actually transforming each of us into small capitalist centers of production. Uh, precisely because of the value of time that I think now is clearer than ever. And I believe, we, if you look at the, this trend in the future, obviously, we don't know how technology will develop, but I would not be surprised that, of course, more and more of our so-called leisure time becomes also commodified, because simply you realize that your leisure time can be also sold. In other words, you have these guys, guys who are calling influencers, for example. So that's yet another occupation which never existed before. So it's actually somebody who is able to actually go and have a vacation, be paid by the company that is, actu that is actually inviting you on the assumption that they will be able to influence others through the you know, social media. And uh, these are not, I don't think these are, kind of, these are kind of funny stories and they are kind of jokes, but actually they are not. I think they are really changing our way of life in a, in a quite dramatic fashion. Yeah. And, and here there also seems to be the case that there are two dimensions to this. Either one is basically what used to be described as freelance work, where you basically trade your time for a certain mm -hmm. service. Uh, but in the, in the area, because I effectively work mm -hmm. like this as well, <laughs> uh, there is a distinction to what you might want to call, a, a one author called a company of one. But the difference being a company of one doesn't necessarily trade time for a service, but you set up a business, say an online yeah, course yeah. or something like this, that g gets automatically sold on a website even though you don't do any work yourself. Yeah, so yeah. it's a matter of scale that you can build in. So the, the, the problem with these uh, freelance mm -hmm. models is there is no scale. Your day has 24 hours, my day has 24 yes. hours, everybody's day has got 24 hours. But if, you, if the, the, the product you're selling is scalable, like say you pr pr create a book, whether right, you sell one right. copy yeah. or a million copies, uh, doesn't make much of a difference if it's print on demand and things like that. Yes, scalability is very important. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, and so that might even accelerate yeah. if people stop just trading their own time, but you know, think about what kind of models are actually scalable beyond uh, time constraints. Yeah, I, I think that you know, this invasion of, oh, I mean, not invasion in a negative sense, because as I said before, we don't really participate willingly in that. Uh, the, the use of our leisure time often as a, either direct money maker or an indirect money maker whereby you use leisure time in the expectation that you would actually do something out of it. I think it's a very, uh, it's a, it's a interesting development. You know, I'm, uh, this is not a direct, I mean, direct commercialization, but it's linked with that. For example, 
uh, before, I, I mean, I noticed change in my own behavior, before when I was reading for years and years books and stuff, uh, I would read, I would actually, I was making notes and all that. But nowadays, because I'm actually publishing for many of these books reviews on my website, my thinking has really changed because you read the book and you immediately feel, well, I have to kind of let other people know what I think. You know, in the past, maybe I would let know like two people and I would not really think very much about that. But I'm now already thinking how it would be done, how I'm going to write it and so on. I'm not doing it for money because I don't need money from that. But let's suppose that I needed money. I would do that. I would then, of course, essentially uh, commodify, market design, uh, com or commercialize my free time which, where I was reading the book. So it really changes even your approach to the book reading or other activities. You know, uh, you know, many people would go to a soccer game, but they would actually then use that to write comments, to send small, uh, you know, um, uh, not blogs, but um, uh, videos of the game to charge, maybe, maybe get some money. You know, it, it is very different now. Yeah, it's, it's interesting because the availability of these things are there. Uh, you, you are thinking about this, how, how you can actually use this. Right? Yes, absolutely. You, know, you, you think actually of, uh, I would say that the opportunity cost of time has become very uh, clear to people. You know, in, in some economic sense, uh, it always existed. But simply because things were not so, so commercialized, 99% of people didn't think of this, you know. Mm -hmm. But now, really, I think more and more people, particularly young people, they do think of this. And in that sense, it is really a huge success of capitalism of having created these new markets. Yeah, and you already mentioned that uh, <laughs> you, you don't know what the future holds, but, you know, this is just an empiric statement at, at the current uh, uh, junction. But so you're not claiming that this is sort of the end of economic history? No, and actually I say, well, maybe it is a local maximum or maybe it is a global maximum. But, you know, in the future, because I think that uh, what we are witnessing now, of course, is driven by technology, as we were just saying, but it's also driven, the first part of my argument was driven by big political change, which resulted in the end of communism. And that resulted in itself in a huge uh, increase in uh, wage labor, <laughs> compared to actually more or less the same, at that time, more or less the same stock of capital. So really the relative positions of capital and labor changed very much. The relative power of capital increased simply because there were so many more uh, workers now. Now, when I say we don't know what will happen in the future, imagine maybe it's a little bit kind of far away, but let me give a sort of a uh, uh, way of thinking about the future. Let's suppose that we, of course, continue growing, countries continue growing, we are actually accumulating more and more assets. This may not be only tangible assets, it will be intangible, but you know, in a way, a capital to, to GDP ratio goes up as it is going up in all the rich countries. You know, Switzerland has eight to one ratio of capital to the GDP. India has a ratio, I think, of 3.5 to GDP. So the rich countries will have more and more capital per unit of output. On the other hand, the world population, we know that is going probably to stagnate, to stop growing at 10 and, 10 and a half or 11 billion people. So then project like that 100 years in the future, we'll have more and more and more and more capital and the same stock of labor. So at some point, it could be that actually the relative powers and capital and labor change, flip compared to what they are now. In that case, you might have a different type of a system which would not be capitalist in the sense that you may not have a hired labor. You might have many more self-employed people. You might more have more and, or more and more of what we now see in startups. When you have individuals who have actually some idea, they don't have a capital, but capital is quite abundant. They are, of course, individual capitalists, but the, the, the entrepreneurial role, which historically was associated with capital, could now shift to labor. And I think startups for me are very interesting because in a startup, typically, you have people who have an idea, but then you have some investor. But what is interesting there, it is not the tra traditional capitalist way of doing business because the entrepreneurial function is in a startup belonging to labor, to mm -hmm. people. Whereas in the traditional capitalist model, you have capital, you then essentially are the organizer of production 
in virtue of your capital and you hire labor. So, you know, we, we can imagine the society where the, the relative positions would be inversed and where uh, labor would hire capital, essentially, and that would not be a capitalist system anymore by very sort of strict Marxist uh, definition. You would still have private ownership of the means of production, but you know you had private ownership of the means of production in what is called petty commodity production. You have peasants who are working on their own land with their own tools, but that's not capitalism. You know, so I, I'm, you know, saying we cannot, we should not be uh, reifying what is now and believe that there is no other system in the future. And interestingly, I mean, if the, the one trend that you described is that the commodification of different life areas and basically turning each individual into at least a small scale capitalist, if you relate that to your, uh, your, your main uh, research area inequality, what we talked about uh, a few years ago, is that a one way to democratize capital ownership? Because one of the sure. defining issues obviously has been yeah. that the, the returns on capital were so concentrated that it created Absolutely. a lot of inequality dynamics. So would that Absolutely. be one of the dynamics that you would like to support because it basically democratizes capital ownership, everybody becomes a capitalist and a wage laborer at the same time? Absolutely, that's actually a very good point. As, as you know, in, in my new book, In Capitalism Alone, I do actually uh, argue that one of the systemic forces which pushes inequality up under the current uh, you know, constellation of ownership is the rising share of total capital, in total capital income in net national income of a society. And the problem with that is essentially that the financial capital is very heavily concentrated. But if, if these new trends actually, uh, which are maybe negative in terms of marketization of our private life, but could be positive in the sense that they are democratizing, as, as you said, access to capital. Actually, we all have become self-employed, we share both labor and capital. And in that sense, yes, it would be actually a positive development. It would, be, it would, not, it would stop this automatic transmission. Yeah, so you have this, this flip side. I mean, yes. on the one hand, you know, the market, um, the ideas of market, so that everything has to have a price and, and is tradable, you know, is permeating more uh, areas of lives. But at the same time, you know, it could be it could be a liberating effect and could have a, a, a could positive be. effect. No, no, it could be actually, it could be a blessing in disguise and actually it could be a blessing in disguise in the sense that enables people who have no capital actually to maybe acquire some because they would start to self-employed people. And then if they are successful, many cases like that, you had people of course who started with nothing basically. They had only a laptop and an idea and then actually gradually became sort of self-employed with both capital and labor uh, and it's true actually it would um, it would uh, flip side is of course it would reduce the, co the very high concentration of capital income which currently exists in rich countries. So okay well that's a, that's a trend to, to watch <laughs> and uh, I mean in your book you, uh, uh, you, you, you introduce the terms uh, liberal meritocratic and political right, uh, yeah. capitalism could you maybe uh, tell our listeners and our viewers what, yes. what, the definition of it. What do you mean by it? Yeah, let me, let me explain because actually I, I was pretty careful about introducing them so they're not just pl uh, plucked out of thin air. You know, the, uh, broadly speaking, the Western capitalism uh, of uh, the current stage is, I think, of two kinds which are similar but they're a little bit different. The, the word meritocratic comes from Rawls' definition of what is called meritocratic equality which simply means that there are no legal impediments to anybody achieving a job, a position in society, or earning money or whatever. W which means essentially that current societies do not have legal restrictions. In the past, obviously, you had legal restrictions. For example, if you were not nobility, you would not accede certain jobs. If you were not born, you know, in such families, it's not only that some positions would be excluded <coughs> in likelihood, in all likelihood, they would be formally excluded. Obviously, in slavery, slaves could not accede to some positions. So that society is what what Rawls would call non-meritocratic. But the current societies don't have that, so it is meritocratic. But I noti I have to emphasize that does not mean what people sometimes use meritocracy to indicate that it somehow deserved income. It simply means there are no legal impediments. 
the liberal part is also coming from uh, Rawls, and the liberal equality is an improvement over meritocratic because it adjusts for two things. It adjusts by taxing inheritance for inequality in parental background, and it has a, a public educa free education, so again, as an adjustment mechanism. So if you look at current uh, Western societies, they are between these two models. You know, we have sort of moved, the U.S. has moved more toward, toward meritocratic and away from liberal as public education became less sort of common, as inheritance tax went down, you know, countries like Sweden abolished inheritance tax and so on. So that's between liberal and meritocratic, but I really use them with a slash because they are very similar. Political capitalism, however, is an entirely different animal, and that's based on the definition that Max Weber has in Economy and Society. Political capitalism is more or less defined as a use of public office for private gain. There is actually a longer definition in Max Weber, but that's the basic idea. And the idea there is that it is a capitalist system, but it's a peculiar capitalist system where you actually become a rich capitalist by leveraging your political power. And that actually, I think, applies to China. So these will be the definitions. Okay, and uh, you also, uh, you know, in your book, uh, have a chapter on how this capitalism and globalization actually uh, do interact. I mean, one obvious, <laughs> uh, obvious element is, uh, is scale, right? So that you have uh, the potential, uh, even the individual, to sell globally rather than, right. you know, rather than just sticking a notice on a tree. You can post that notice right, globally, right. and you might not just attract customers right. from your neighborhood, but globally. But how do you see these, <coughs> these new type of, of capitalism that interacts with you know, history, uh, technological development? How, how does globalization play a role in this? You know, I uh, discussed that in, in chapter four of my book, as you know. And <coughs> I, I think actually there I discussed four areas of interaction between globalization and first one, globalization and labor. And there, <coughs> of course, the most important uh, uh, interaction between globalization and labor is through migration. That's an enormous topic, as we know, like on a daily basis. I do introduce, actually expand on what was already in, in, uh, in um, uh, Global Inequality book and even in some other papers that I did before on this idea, which is not only mine, other people had similar idea, of um, a circular migration. But I expand a little bit about that because I, I'm also arguing and I'm putting that idea in the context of, I think, our need to redefine citizenship. You know, citizenship currently is a, is a binary category, either you're a citizen or you're not. And it is a relatively recent category. It's actually a category which is actually, if you look back, didn't exist 200 years ago. Uh, but now it is a very clear binary. But then we have more and more um, categories which are in between. You have residency, people with residency permits, you have people who actually buy these residency permits, then people who of course use that to eventually become citizen. And I think that actually for globalization to function and for migration to function within the political constraints which exist, we have to actually broaden that uh, middle area where you could live in a country for a given period of time, have a job, have all the conditions from that country, but then ne not become citizen and have to return to your country of origin. So I will not expand on that because it is a, a, a very complex topic. But I just would like to point out to your you know, listeners one interesting twist. Again, it's a little bit projection into the future. Uh, we currently are um, used we are used to the situation, for example, you are in Germany, your income, generally for many people, comes from working in Germany, from earning money here, and from earning money from other activities that are being sold or, you know, exchanged with other people in Germany. Now, obviously, you can export or import and so on, so we, we have that trade, international trade as well. But imagine the situation where you, being a German, <coughs> would actually at some point, and as many Germans already do that, go and live abroad and receive income from Germany, whether you have, because you have a pension income or other income. So that income would come to you who are actually have degrounded yourself from German sort of grounds. You live, for example, in Italy and Spain, the income comes from you from Germany. 
But that income that comes from Germany could, in the future, really come from German investments in China. So you would then have what actually lie there, you would have a total degrounding of citizenship and income. You would have a German investments in Germany generating net return, which would have then kind of recycled through German kind of official administration and send somebody who is actually living in, in Spain. So in other words, what you see there is that both physical presence of individuals can be degrounded from their country and even the earning potential can be degrounding. So that I think actually in the air, in the at the time of globalization means that we really have to really rethink what is really uh, citizenship. We have to really think what is e even what are national accounts anymore. So that was the part about labor. So I don't want go to go to extend to all of that. Let me just put only a little bit, just a little bit about the, the relationship between capital and globalization, because here I think that the global value chains have played an extremely important role in spreading this capitalist mode of production to the countries where they would really not have come. Uh, not only China, but look, let's take uh, uh, Burma, Bangladesh. You would not have had the development of this global capitalism without global value chains. So that's something that I actually talk also in that part about globalization and capital. And especially maybe financial value chains. I mean, the, yes, the, the exa true. example exactly. you mentioned is, is very nice. Maybe, maybe just the portfolio manager is based in Germany, but he basically puts the money in a globally diversified portfolio. You're, you're earning capital returns from investments all over the globe. It arrives in Germany, but the, the, you know, the bank transfer goes to Spain. And, and you, you actually, you see that you don't even sort of earn that money in Germany physically. You earn that money elsewhere because German company had the money to invest or German government, well, I suppose you can actually have, well, I, mean, uh, glo uh, nation, I mean, wealth funds, you know. Yeah. So, you know, I, I, I think what is interesting is the total degrounding both of acquisition of income and of the, the consumption or use of that income. And uh, this is a very different world because uh, all of these functions in the past were very much grounded within, within a nation state. Yeah. And, and, you know, that, that, that goes to what we discussed before. I'm personally a big fan of, of sovereign wealth funds because it's what, what we discussed at the micro level, the democratization of capital ownership, yeah. can do this on the macro on level. On the macro level, absolutely. Yeah. So making sure that, you know, if everything yeah. is capitalist, more and more people benefit but, yeah. from it. And uh, maybe an interesting discussion, uh, yeah. how do you see your argument intersect with the, uh, uh, the, the, the literature or the, the thought about the varieties of capitalism? Right, so the, the sort of the Rhenish capitalism, uh, yes, simply, yeah. you know, symbolized by Germany, where we are based now, or more the Anglo-Saxon economies that are uh, more uh, quick to adapt, and you know, uh, it's more incrementalism in, in the case of Germany. Do you see one type of capitalism being particularly well suited for these kind of dynamics, or one particularly worse suited? I mean, in Germany, as we, where if we're based here in Berlin at the moment. Uh, there's a discussion, have we missed the train yeah. on, uh, on a lot of these developments? And, uh, you know, can we catch the next one, <laughs> <laughs> right? So, but on, 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 the, on the other hand, uh, in, in uh, quicker and more dynamic uh, settings, you might just, uh, you know, trash value uh, for no particularly good reason and, uh, you know, jump on every train, even though it might not <laughs> uh, lead to any specific uh, destination. So where would you see uh, this, this capitalism <coughs> that you describe interact with these different models of capitalism? You know, that's a, that's a very good question. I have to say that I, uh, uh, I'm um, uh, very much in favor of, obviously, like lots of political uh, economy and the political science literature deals with variety of capitalisms. And um, although it is, I must say, also fairly limited because these varieties of capitalism basically is still within the West European slash North American uh, paradigm, you know. We have now capitalisms which are still not included in that. For example, African capitalism, we don't talk about that in that context. Even Latin America, which has been studied a lot, is somewhat not fully integrated. And obviously China is not at all. Uh, <coughs> but I would uh, answer your question by saying that my thinking in, in this liberal meritocratic capitalism, political capitalism, is that it, it is a more abstract level. So I'm fully in agreement that actually 
uh, all the other forms of capitalism, uh, as you mentioned, brainish capitalism, or more sort of different, obviously, in many respects, in the role of the stock market, for example, or more Anglo-Saxon capitalism, all that. They are actually absolutely fine. I just see them, if I can sort of be graphic in that, I can see them as sort of uh, uh, more precise definitions of this uh, more uh, broad type or more broad genus of the two types of capitalism. Uh, so it's a little bit like, uh, which I like always I mean, to retell the story of, uh, I think it is in Borges, in Ficciones, where he talks about the guy who actually was totally unable to, uh, to, to generalize things. So actually for him, there was no such a thing as a dog. They were all different dogs. You know, they were, because obviously there is a one dog, small dog, a big dog, and so on. So a little bit it's like that. If you really, I would say capitalism for me is generalizable, you know, in a very narrow definition. But it does have many in individual forms. So I would actually be fully in agreement that the work on different types is, is not only legitimate, but extremely useful. But the level of abstraction is different from the one that I have. Yeah. And this, uh, I mean, I should, should maybe put it again back to Peter Hall. The, uh, yes, uh, the it should be, should be updated, not yeah. just by um, uh, the, the elements <coughs> you mentioned, you know, Chinese state capitalism, African capitalism, uh, but also the development of technology. It's not, as Absolutely. far as I can see, it's not really reflected in the, in the, uh, in the discussion. You know, Henry, one thing that I actually want to mention, just because we're having a free conversation, I, I was recently talking to my uh, social, I mean, political science friends, <coughs> and I, I really, uh, maybe I'm not a reader of most uh, recent literature, but I've been to a number of conferences because I'm interested in political developments. But in 20 years, uh, you know, it is always the same discussion of essentially 20 countries, you know. Uh, uh, and uh, even, even if not 20 countries, maybe even 15. But, you know, the world has changed tremendously. I would like to include in these discussions about political science and changes and relationship between capitalism and voting behavior and all that. I really, I would like to include countries like Thailand. I would like to include countries like Indonesia, of course, Brazil, Latin America, Peru, uh, South Africa, Nigeria. And to me, it seems that the, that part of the so, uh, social, I mean, political science that I see is still very much discussing the issues that we discussed, you know, 30 years ago, whether, you know, a sort of uh, uh, welfare system or the political system of more corporatist countries like Austria, how much different it is from social democratic Sweden. We have to go past that, you know, it is, uh, you yeah. know, uh, the world has changed. We, we cannot do that all yeah. the time. Maybe it's because it's straddling discipline in political science, right? Because <laughs> it used to be the study of authoritarianism that looked at these countries and now... Oh, that's true, yeah, you're and, right. And, and, and now it should be the people who study Absolute. actually political economy yes. of capitalism, you're right. right? So you're they're, right. they're maybe not used yeah. to these cases, but you're absolutely yeah. right. I mean, the, the, the world has become much more diverse in that sense uh, yeah. and more equal at the same time. That's so true. It, 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 should be, it should be studied more broadly. And uh, uh, towards the end, I mean, because it's, uh, it's, al it's always great having a, a free conversation and you could, you could go on for hours. But if you think about, um, <coughs> because our focus has always yeah. been for uh, people who are involved in the policy making process. Uh, on the basis of all right. of these different aspects that we discussed so far, uh, how would you recommend policymakers should prepare, or what kind of policies would be conducive, you know, to adapt, uh, you know, countries, political economies to these dynamics, and make sure that you know most people or many people benefit from it, and, and not we are not having the same effects that we had in the past, which meant concentration of wealth and, and benefit. You know, I'm glad that you asked that question because I I did spend some time. On recommendations, not too many, and I didn't want to be very specific because, again, uh, first of all, I don't know individual countries, and if you really wor work in a fairly high level of abstraction, I don't think you should, it makes many, much sense to go and write sort of what individual countries should do. Uh, you know, if you look at Tony Atkinson's book, that was precisely designed to address the problems of inequality in the UK. If you look at the most recent book by, by Saez and Zuckman, it is really addressed now for the not only problems of inequality in the US, but even more specifically or locally to the problem of the election next year. Uh, so my summary actually is really very simple and actually have four points there. Uh, the fir uh, uh, first, I think that we, we are in a need 
of a change division which would go past what exactly ex had in the, we had in the 20th century. In the 20th century, when you face problem of inequality, you actually introduced, uh, rightly, uh, many instruments for redistribution of current income. I will not go now, it's very well known, from unemployment benefits to child allowances to pensions and all that. It's the redistribution of current income. It's created and then you actually redistribute because some people have made contributions or some people are actually in need because they had a child or maybe they are sick and so on. I think that that model has reached a certain limit for many reasons, you cannot really get much more out of it, either because the middle class doesn't want to pay higher taxes anymore, or because education, in terms of number of years, education has achieved certain really, you know, close to the maximum, or because trade unions are much weaker now than they used to be in the past. So my point then is <coughs> a, a different vision whose objective would be what I call people's capitalism, which means the, uh, a greater equality in endowments. And then obviously if you have greater equality in financial capital between people and in skill levels which en enable you to actually accede to differently paid, high paid jobs, then your, at, uh, your effort on the redistribution of current income can actually be much less because there is no, less need to redistribute. That then has led me to actually four policy conclusions. One is a re, uh, <coughs> reduce the concentration of capital incomes, a topic that we just talked about, how even technology might actually help do that, or differently, policy can do that from employee stock ownership plans, workers' shares, salarial, a special uh, tax advantages for the small investors. So there, there is a gamut of things, you know, a little bit like what, what the Labour Party is currently suggested in the UK, that everybody above, I think, 50 employees is obliged to actually have a given distribution of share to workers. So that's deconcentration of capital ownership. The second one, uh, make access to high skill, high quality public education equal. So high quality public means that actually you would be having public education, free public education for everybody and people would be able to really get to the very high paying jobs. Because obviously in the case like in the US, you are essentially excluded for these jobs because you really have to pay enormous amount of money to go to the fancy schools. So that's number two. Number three, is the introduction of inheritance taxation, which is really important for the reasons that I said before. And number four, change uh, the immigration policy. And that was, I'm talking about this circular migration and things like that. And I think migration should be really because of its importance and because it deals with the factor of production should be put on the same level of importance. So really deconcentration of capital, uh, uh, equalization of skill levels of what people call human capital, um, introduction of inheritance taxation and uh, uh, end of this binary concept of citizenship. So I think these are very uh, sort of uh, clear in a general sense recommendations and they can be operational, operationalized very differently from country to country. You know, for example, in the case of Germany, public education is much stronger than in the US. Maybe n not much can be done on, on public education, but maybe then on inheritance taxation it could be. So, you know, that's... that's, that's yeah, and I think that was one of the key <coughs> insights from your uh, in inequality research that uh, I think you cannot just rely on the secondary distributions after taxes to True. take all the burden. You have to intervene in the primary distribution absolutely. to take to take the pressure right. the off the load. Yeah, Absolutely. So, and, and that can be done via all sorts of things, becoming individual <laughs> capitalists, having sovereign wealth funds, having worker shares, it's a, it's a whole variety of things. Yeah, yeah sovereign wealth fund, of course. So, for example, what also in the 70s, the, I think that was the Swedish uh, uh, trade unions, LO, I think, they were suggesting uh, this idea of having trade union shares. That would be, of course, then the, the, the proceeds would be, uh, would be um, uh, paid to workers. I think it was the earned income uh, fund, something. It was it earned income? Yeah, 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 it it never actually came to, to, to realization, but the idea was there. Yeah, yeah. 
And I think they did, they trialed it if I remember correctly, and but they had very poor portfolio investors. Oh really? <laughs> yeah, I yeah. See. So I think they lost they lost money rather oh, than they sort lost of diversified money. risk. But uh, that's yeah. from the top of my head. I, c I could be wrong. But uh, but you know, I think one has also to distinguish that from the co determination of the German style, because the co determination is really something which is valuable, but it's a different story. It's a story of participation in management. Uh, what I'm talking about is really the story of worker ownership and worker ownership in the sense that you're actually employee ownership in the sense that you're really f uh, uh, private owner of a capital share. Now that share, obviously you can sell, you don't need to hold it or you can sell it when you leave the company or you can sell it when you're in a company, but you receive it as a part of your package. Yeah. And this comes back to varieties of capitalism. I mean, co-determination as a critical feature of German corporate governance could be the mechanism with which you can actually introduce maybe the worker share more easily uh, than in other systems because the worker representation is, is more... Is present there. Is there, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's true. But I just think, you know, sometimes people interpret what I'm saying by saying it's, it's, it's co-determination. Co-determination, of course, is different. It's absolutely it's about management, not about the ownership. Yeah. yeah, the one is corporate governance, the other one is ownership. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Okay, <coughs> Frank, thank you very much indeed. Again, and uh, I'm, I'm absolutely <coughs> sure this topic uh, will remain hot for yes, years to come. Will, thank you very much. It was a pleasure, as yeah, always. Thank you. thank you very much for listening. We hope you enjoyed it. Make sure you don't miss future episodes by subscribing to Social Europe Podcast. You can also read our articles on www.socialeurope.eu and follow us on Facebook and on Twitter at Social Europe. Until next time.